look at similarities. Okay, so kind of taking a small break from the <clears throat> models and looking at like what we can calculate with these models. So we did uh, LSA and then a topics model and the networks models. And so now we're gonna do a little bit of like, what does similarity even mean? Because we were talking about how, how much words mean the same thing um, or how similar they are. And so we're not necessarily talking about similarity in the sense of synonyms but we're talking about uh, similarity in the sense that they're used in similar contexts and they probably have related meanings, right? but they're not synonyms. So I think sometimes people confuse like they mean the same thing, which makes them very similar, and they have a relationship to each other, which also makes them similar. Okay. So one of the biggest pairs um, or most similar pairs of words in these, these databases is uh, off on, okay. those are very related in, in meaning. They're antonyms, they're opposites. Okay. And then we have things like brother, sister, which also, those aren't really opposite. I guess they're kind of opposites, I don't know. Um, so they're very similar, right. but that does not mean that they're synonyms. So that's one thing I always wanna start with, is making sure we're, you realize we're not talking about similarity as the exact same meaning although that fits under the similarity umbrella. Okay, so let me launch it out here. I'm gonna close this window, and then I'm gonna go ahead and open, oh, excuse me, Coca. Okay, so we're gonna use the Corpus of Contemporary American English for this example, and we can actually work on like uh, trying to update some of the numbers I have, which are probably out of date. So what we're going to focus on uh, specifically is collocations. Okay, so these are words or collocates um, that occur together more frequently than you might expect to do chance. So like the phrase peanut butter is considered a, uh, a compound phrase really, but or a collocate, where that combination is more frequent than one might expect given that other words that we see with peanut butter and other words that we see with butter. Okay. So that combination means something different. They're, they're similar. So we're defining similarity here as used together. Okay. Um, they, they have a, this connection to each other. Okay. So really this, this lecture should be called connections. So that's kind of vague. Right. Um, we'll also look at engrams. These are in words that occur together. And we'll mostly focus on bigrams um, because that's pairs of words together, although you could do this as complete phrases like we did last week. And then we'll look at the ingram viewer. So let me oop, 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 back, back, back. Also look at the ingram viewer here. And then um, if you want to learn more, I have a XKCD, which is a math comic strip. He has some of his favorite ingram charts in here. And then the, the, the specific uh, paper I'm going to talk about today is actually also a TED Talk, and it's one of my favorite TED Talks ever. Um, I've probably watched it like 15 or 20 times. It's just so great. So it's about um, how Google built their built Google Books and what they did with it. And that part of what they did with it was this ingram viewer. Um, I don't know why it looks so weird, but uh, like I think they've changed it just here a little bit. Because uh, the dates now are up to 2019, which is really cool because it used to only be 2008. So this has actually happened in the last little bit because they even have more languages now than they had before. So that's cool. So we'll come back to this. All right. So from the TED Talk and from the Michelle paper that's attached for the week, they talk about what's called culturomics. And I'm hoping that across all these lectures, we've talked about you know more traditional academics with um, category formation and stuff. But it, there's a lot of, of language research that's sociolinguistics, right? Understanding culture, society, and language. Um, as we see, like someone, I remember when this whole thing started talking about how social distancing was such a terrible phrase, but now we're kind of stuck with it, and like culturally you know, we should have maybe used something distinct, distinct, different because it's actual physical distancing, right? Um, but culturomics is this coin, torn, a term coined by these guys. Um, 
to describe how they were pulling information from the Google Books data set to think about humans. So using language as the lens to understand culture is the idea. So we can understand cultural movements by things that go viral, phrases that get used more. So like Black Lives Matter comes to mind. And that might actually be a really cool one to put in here. Let's see. So one problem that we're going to have, right, is that the data set starts in 1800, and that clearly is a, a cultural trend from, you know, now. So looking like it's starting here in 2012, and now it's only increased over time. Now this isn't going to be a perfect uh, example because we aren't going to be able to compare. So the kind of um, other phrase that people tend to use in opposition is all lives matter. Right. And we can see that that is much way less frequent okay, than black lives matter. And so we'll talk about like what, if, what information does this tell me in a minute. Okay. So in this, in this TED talk and in the paper, they talk about how they looked at 4% at the time um, of all printed books. Okay, so this is actually, the Ingram viewer has now clearly been updated. And so that is a lot, like 4% of printed books of all time is kind of an amazing number, okay? Digitized by Google as part of Google, Google Books. Okay? And it's a corpus of over 500 billion words. It's probably even more now, okay? across seven or more languages. And one thing they do is provide these estimates of the number of words. So I get, I feel like when people learn that I study language, that's one of the, how, how many languages are there? And I'm like, it's like somewhere between seven and 8,000. Well, how do we know? <laughs> like is it linguists, <laughs> other people who, who study this for real, and this is not me. Um, but that's the first question. And then the next question ends up being, well, how many words are there? And I'm like, a lot, but you probably only use 10,000 on a regular basis. Okay. And so like how many words are there? And this provides us a nice estimate. So there are about 1 million different words that are at least one part per billion. Okay. And I would argue that that seems like a really tiny number, <laughs> right? And so um, I have read places that there are about 10,000 that we use on a daily basis. Right, comes and goes, depends on your level of expertise in a specific area. Right? So I imagine that you guys don't say homogeneity as many times in a day as I probably do. Um, but given your job, you probably say words that I never use. Right? Um, and with that, we can also look at like what are the most common words, that kind of stuff. Um, and that research dovetails nicely with the subtitle projects that we talked about. So there are words that we tend to use and then there are specialty words. And the dictionary, so things like Merriam-Webster, even though for a long time, you know, Merriam-Webster really limited what was in it because it was printed. And so this was like the, the common English, if you will, or the common language. But now they don't really have that problem anymore. You know, they, they put stuff um, on the internet, which just takes up bytes instead of paper, but the dictionary itself really only covers a small portion of these words. So there are plenty of words that we use that are not really captured in current dictionaries. Okay. And there, um, this whole data set proof has another proof for Zipf's Law. So remember the Zipf's Law is that the most frequent word is twice as frequent as the next frequent word, three times as frequent, and so it makes that inverse power function. Uh, which we saw in our linear regression chapter. And so now we can start to get into the culture piece of this. That's just like some basic linguistics. And um, kind of to me what is kind of a interesting, also slightly boring question is the, the, the competition of verb types. Okay. So there are regularized and irregular forms of verbs, right? So burnt is an irregular form of that verb meaning it doesn't follow the past tense rules where we have ED. Found is an irregular version. Dwelt and dwelled. And now I don't know that I've ever said find it in my life, but maybe people do, so let's look. So let's start with burnt versus burned. 
it's a, oh, sorry. Yeah, I was like, let me talk about when we change over. Move back up a year. There we go. And so if we look at the trajectory of the regular and irregular forms of this word, what we see is that that switches here in about 1875. So for a long time, we were actually using the regular form of the verb and then switched to a more regularized form. And this, uh, if you've read 1984, uh, kind of tends to remind me of that, of the fact that languages tend to simplify over time. So yes, we're always creating new words, but we're also always pruning old words and getting rid of irregular forms. So it's more likely that what we would see is that we're, we're more likely to trend toward regularization, making it easier because um, an irregular form is something you have to memorize. But let's compare this to British English. Okay, so let's look at American English, because that's all English. And we see in American English, it actually changes over in about 1850. In British English, be surprised, get ready, it's way later. So it doesn't actually start to change <laughs> until um, it's like pretty much like do 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 trucking along until about the 2000s. So what we're actually seeing here is not only is it we're tending to regularize, but as a, a culture, a country, trying to distinguish ourselves from past roots. Okay. And so in British English, you see this switch way later. Okay. And so that 1850s is the average, basically. But um, uh, this is a completely different trajectory of those words. So let's try one more. I don't know that I have ever said find it, but let's see. And so you don't always see this, is the point, right? So find it pretty much non-existent, except for the British English. Also non-existent, okay, let's look at dwelt, which I have said, oops, spelling. Third time's a charm. Dwell. And what we see is the irregular form is slowly losing, losing favor. This is also not a, a super common word. Lived would be more common for us to use. But we see that same trend um, for both English, uh, American and British English. So by looking at those, we can tell that there's something different about this burnt and burned distinction, right? Because it doesn't, it isn't true. It's not like all of them have the same pattern. It's the fact that they have different patterns is what's interesting. So another thing that they talk about is the, the frequency of, of naming for famous people. And so what we see is that people who are famous have a rapid fame rise, a peak, and then a half-life. So let's see here. Who can we look up? I, I want to save um, an example for later. Think about Bill Nye, although he's still around. Since we have newer, newer, um, ooh, what the heck is this? This is an old, old, <laughs> an older thing here. So let's see, when did, let's say 1980. Yeah, what we know is, is um, more current, right? So they have this rapid rise to fame right? and then a half-life. Now he's seeing a resurgence in fame, so to speak, because uh, they restarted the show and he's, doing all these TikToks. <laughs> but this idea of like rapid rise to fame and then a half-life. Uh, can I spell Neil deGrasse Tyson's name correctly? I'm so happy they updated this. We can do newer examples. Okay. So we've got this rapid rise to fame and he has not half-life yet. Okay. Uh, and then we can also do, uh, instead of scientists here, people like Brad Pitt. So he's crested. We're working on his half-life. Here, sorry. And so this rise to fame, this increase in mentions, is affected by job choice. So actors and actresses show earlier peaks than writers and politicians, and that's because we tend to prefer younger folks for actors and actresses. Um, the politicians tend to be older um, to be well known. Um, now, to me, the most interesting part of this TED Talk and their paper is the section on suppression and censorship. 
And what we can find is after things have happened, so you can't quite do this in the time that it's happening, for what I hope are obvious reasons, um, but after an event has occurred, kind of like we can look through and look at history and determine like when cultural suppression was occurring. And so we, this is no particular, um, this happens everywhere is what I'd like to show you an example of across countries. So we'll look at Russia, Russia, and Trotsky, political, um, Mark Chagall is a Jewish painter in Germany, Tiananmen Square, another political incident, and then the U.S. Hollywood 10, right? And so the Hollywood 10 is also political, then um, the communism scare, the red scare in the U.S. So this is not any one culture that does this. This happens across all of them. So let's look at this graph, and then I'll show you a more recent example that we can see in the U.S. culture. So this top one up here is Mark Schgall comparing German to English, who is a very famous Jewish painter. And what their argument here is that, um, you know, we have this rise to fame. So people have these predictable trajectories that we can see if we know they have become famous. And in English, we see that trajectory. It continues to go up. Right? But in German, it totally drops off. And so they look for these points in which there are these huge dips, but then after the dip, it continues. To, it, it, it should be a linear pattern, but there's a clear outlier section, so to speak. Right? And so, of course, this is um, World War II, World War I, World War II, Jewish painter. So tied to um, a, a world war. Trotsky here, we see the suppression here when he was kind of ousted. And we get, um, I think this is when he was murdered. Don't quote me on any of this. Um, I, went to, I went to school in the U.S. so my world history. A little shaky sometimes, right? Uh, and then in Texas. So the only thing important was Texas. <laughs> uh, but anyway, so like, you know, ousted, not cool anymore. Um, so you see this, these small dips. Uh, we see Tiananmen here. There's this a big difference in the report rates. So people are like essentially not talking about it. It didn't happen. And then here um, in the U.S., this era would be the McCarthy era, right? the Red Scare, when we were really frightened of communism. Um, and these the Hollywood 10 were blacklisted for being communists. And so essentially, they none of them could get jobs, and um, and people just stopped talking about them because it was it was bad. But then afterwards, when we realize like, uh, right, that was not cool, you see there all their mentions can go back up. And so these these simple frequency counts, the simple bag of words approach, can really tell us a lot about um, political events. So one of my former students did something very similar, looking at political language words. And you can see things like um, when um, certain dictators were ousted in, in the Middle East. And I think it's called what's called the Arab Spring, which is where there were a bunch of political uprisings. Right? Um, the bad thing about this kind of work is that you really can only see it after it's happened. Right? You can't quite see it while it's happening. Because there is always a political, there is always a half-life on this famousness. And so before we can do that, I want to show you a more recent example, but i got to back up. Let's just do 1920 to zoom way out, although this is a little early. And not, and not do Brad Pitt. We're going to do Martin Luther King. And Malcolm X. Compare these two to each other. <clears throat> so what we see is this rapid rise to fame, right? and then what this era here before they start to go back up. This right civil rights movement, lots of Jim Crow eras uh, laws, and sort of the U.S. unrest. Um, and I think if we if we were able to see this ten five years from now, we would see the same thing happening right now. Right, with all the protests and the sort of uprising and the kind of things that are going on, what we would see is the, the rise for things like Black Lives Matter. And then during this period, we might see a decrease of, of people mentioning things and then uh, because we're going to pretend it's not happening. Right? 
and then um, an increase later. Or maybe with the instant news cycle and the constant press, we might not see that. So it's kind of an interesting question of whether these kinds of, of events will continue, this kind of pattern that we see will continue given um, brain fart, sorry, given the way that we report the news and consume things and have Twitter and all these kinds of things, right? Um, and so I bet you would still see those effects, but you may have to see it from a, from, from, um, a, in a different perspective, so to speak. Like there are certain people who are doing the suppression, but we have things like Twitter and we don't see that suppression. So we might be able to make that comparison. But uh, I wanted to show that there are more recent examples of this exact same effect. Um, and it's not just, you know, uh, old stuff. It's still, it's still happening. This clear depression. All right. So some considerations when working with any of Google's stuff, right? Um, when we're scanning things, optical character recognition isn't perfect. So any kind of data that you have a scanned, you have to kind of be careful with, especially older data sets or if fancy letters. So sometimes the S and the F look very similar given the way the print that's used. The metadata, so the data about the data, is not definitely not perfect. So we have to take these um, trends and these effects into long-term consideration <clears throat> because there's a certain point in which the dates are accurate. <coughs> Excuse me. Newer stuff will be more accurate. We're just better at time stamping things. Right? And then we always have to also deal with synonymy. And my example for synonymy is now finally going to work. Tweet. So um, it almost like drowns it out completely. So let me let me um, back up even more. And let me kill speed one sixty. Oh, nope, a little further back. I don't remember when Twitter started. Eh, it's a little bit better. Okay, so what we see is over time, tweet has clearly had mentions we're using it. But the, the, the peak here in the 1800s is definitely a different use of the word than we're using it now. We used to only have this data set up to like 2008 and you wouldn't, you couldn't see this trend. But now that they have the full data set up, we can see that there is uh, clearly a previous use of the word tweet and um, the current use of the word tweet. So synonymy is the same thing as polysemy, multiple meaning, but uh, especially over time. So words change meaning and their uses change um, quite a bit, uh, especially over long periods of time. So you have to be careful with the words that you pick and understand their interpretation during that time period. Now, I would love to continue to do stuff that's like long-term time-wise, but those data sets are really like quite difficult to find. Um, I would say Google is one of the only ones that really has a good real good data set for this other than the subtitle project because you have the the you know when the movie was made uh, so we're going to look at kind of time free stuff right now um, but that this kind of time association it could be really cool to do this this kind of analysis over time like when do these two phrases become the same or when do um when does one become more positive than the other and so you would take these measures we're about to talk about and apply them in a kind of a long longitudinal way. So for the like sassy part tonight, something to clarify is distance versus association. And I think for this, like it's really, um, I think people use these different measures and most people use association measures, but distance measures have their place. So distance measures are used to show how related things are. Um, by conceptualizing relationship as the essential driving distance is the way I think about it. So things that are closer together are more similar, and things that are further apart are less similar. If we think about physical space, that's true. Culturally, things, uh, cities that are closer together are going to be more similar than cities that aren't. And so an association measure is like one minus distance, sort of, not quite, but it's that idea that it's the opposite where um, it's to show the relationship or the connection between items. 
And so these are things that are generally scaled correlation style, right? Zero to one, where zero is no relationship and one is all the relationship. Okay. Um, so the biggest difference here is scaling and interpretation. Now, association measures don't have to be scaled to one, it's just that most of them are. Okay. So let's talk about distance measures first. And technically, um, when we were calculating all those cosine relationships on our LSA, or our topics models, um, those are technically a measure of distance. And when you build these word space models, you can measure the, the distance between vectors okay, or embeddings. And so some rules for distance measures, they can't be negative. Okay? So zero is the minimum, and that means per, you know, very similar, right? On, the distance is, is almost none. So also, too, this happens in like clusters. So all the pictures we've been drawing and we said everything that's close together is related. That means they have a small or no distance. If x and y are the same, the distance is zero. And um, what should make a good distance measure but does not always happen is the x to y distance. So if I was to drive from here to Philly, that should be the same as if I was to drive from Philly to here. Okay. The distance should be the same. Um, who knows, it might not be, depending on where you start, right? But the idea is that they're the same distance apart. And then the hardest one that many distance measures actually fail, but that's okay, is the distance of x to y plus the distance of y to z is less than or equal to the distance of x to z. This is the idea that the three points in space have to meet the rules of triangles. Um, and this is just your basic kind of um, rule, like hypotenuse, hypotenuse rules for triangles, right? Um, so that the sum of the two sides can't be longer than a third. Um, distance measures don't always follow those rules, but a good distance measure would. The key here is the first two. Can't be negative. Okay. Um, and if they're exactly the same, the distance is zero. Now, what distance measures do we actually use? And the most popular one is easily string distance. So string distance measures tell you the match between two, two or more strings. So believe and believe misspelled is a potentially, a, you know, we'll talk about how many distance measures, but um, it's a pretty good match, it's just misspelled. And then cat to hat is very similar to each other. Um, but there's a phoneme change okay, between the two words, a letter change. And so I can calculate hamming distance, and that counts the number of character substitutions that turns B into A. So for believe, I change the I to an E and that E to an I. So I, I have to change both of these letters, so the hamming distance is 2. Cat to hat, the hamming distance is 1, I only have to change one letter. Easily the most popular is Levenstein distance. And this one, um, so with Hamming distance, you can't add or subtract, I don't think. You only are substituting. With Levenstein distance, you have, you can delete, insert, or substitute. In this case, um, these two will be equal because we're not making any deletions or insertions. But if I have cats, plural, to hat, that would be 2 for Levenstein distance, deleting the S, changing the C to an H. And then another really pretty popular one um, that I've seen more lately is optimal string alignment, which is Levenstein distance but allows for a flip. And that's really useful in spell checking because this here is really one distance apart. They flipped the letters. Okay, in a Levenstein distance, that would be 2 because that's changed the I and then changed the E. But an optimal string allowance, allow, allowance, like it's got money, alignment, it allows you to just flip those two. So this one's actually one. <clears throat> so let's look at those. And there's a cool R package called string dist that will allow you to do this. So I've got words, words. And then we just um, calculate how distant, how far apart they are. So we see two and one and two and one, what we expected. 
on the R, um, OSA is one and one because we allow for that flip of characters. Cool. So a lot of spell checkers work this way. They find um, in their dictionary, they find a word that they don't see in the dictionary and then they compare it to words that are um, have the smallest string distance to make a suggestion. And that's why sometimes the suggestions seem ridiculous. It's because the small string distance has nothing to do with meaning. Um, cosine is an interesting measure because it, it can be both. So cosine is often can be used as a distance measure, and it can also be used as an association measure. And I actually have like written papers with this where someone was like, you're not explaining cosine. And I have had to go in and be like, cosine as an association measure means blah, 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 like explain it. So um, I can always tell, like, here's a math person, because <laughs> it's often thought of as a, uh, an angle distance between two vectors. And, but it doesn't have to be. It can actually be essentially the, the correlation between vectors. Right. So um, they're just inverses of each other. Well, you have to tell people which one you're using because that completely changes your interpretation. So you can actually calculate cosine on, as a string distance measure. And it's often defined as like a number of shared features. So when I use cosine, I'm talking about the number of shared features between two vectors, two words, two whatevers. When I define it that way, it becomes an association measure, where zero means no shared features, these words are completely different, and one means a perfect match, so the same word. However, as a distance metric, zero means they have exactly the same features, no distance between them. One indicates um, no overlap, completely shared. Which one would I use? Well, I think intuitively people like association measures better because we're, as a society, kind of familiar with this idea of correlation. Okay. Now, we're certainly very familiar with distance. Things that are closer are closer. But when you say things that are closer are more similar, it starts to interact with this idea of association. But we can also use cosine in a similar way. The nice thing about the cosine metric here is that it's scaled 0 to 1. Right. Um, so, uh, you know, you essentially would take the Levenstein or other distances and divide them, sort of normalize them. Now notice here that for between believe and believe misspelled, that gave us zero as a distance metric, meaning they're exactly the same. Because they do contain exactly the same letters. Um, so it doesn't capture that spelling problem, but it does capture that they're exactly the same combination of letters. So I can use that and the, the things like uh, Levenstein distance to help improve my spell check. Now the point three three I think confuses people because cat and hat overlap by two thirds, right? They have the at together, but their distance is only a third apart because they're only one letter different and one out of three is a third. So let's switch now into association measures. Okay, so there's a lot of distance measures that I'm skipping, right? We did Euclidean distance already, and Manhattan distance as part of cluster analysis. So there are other distance metrics that we can use. But when we're wanting to talk about how similar two things are, string distance is kind of the place people use. All right, so association measures capture this non-symmetric relationship between items. So uh, family feud here. Uh, Family Feud is a game show where people are, you know, if I walked up to 100 people on the street and said, cheese, what are the words that people are going to say next, right? They do phrases and it's kind of crazy and it's meant to be crazy. It's meant to be ridiculous. But um, we can play this exact same game okay, and ask people for their associations because then we could build a cool network model. And my friends at the small world of, world of words have done this. And so if I look at the old data, I need to update this, but uh, that's okay. If I ask 100 people, geez, how many times does cheddar occur as the next word? Like their first thing that comes to mind is cheddar. And it's 21 people. 
it's not bad. So it's about 20% of the time. So this. However, if I go up to you and go, what's the first word you think of? Cheddar. Everyone says cheese. It's nearly 100%. Cheddar, cheddar to cheese is a cola kit that's very popular. Okay, cheese to cheddar, however, not as popular. Cheese, mouse, right, food. Um, uh, then other types of cheese get named as well at some some frequency. Um, cheddar is kind of an American thing, <laughs> you know. Uh, I don't know that the, the French would say cheddar <laughs> as much as we do, but you get the idea that they're not symmetric. And distance measures are supposed to be symmetric, so this is now an association measure. And um, the idea here is that they have this idea of a uh, not an idea. The thing, the reason this happens, is called conditional probability. So conditional probability is this idea that depending on which way that you conceptualize your question, you will get different answers. And conditional probabilities are a problem right now, right? That I think what we see when we, when we see people talking on TV about the likelihoods of getting sick and the um, the, you know, who does this affect and that kind of stuff. We're, we're talking about conditionalizing on, um, you know, age or, you know, because young people don't get it, so we should send them back to school. Uh, or conditionaling, conditionalizing on, uh, you know, some other variables that are important. But they're not the same each way. Okay. So a conditional probability table, it looks like it's a little two by two. And if you've taken machine learning and done any of that, this will look familiar. This is confusion matrix. And so what we're going to do here is put in cola kits. Okay, so things like peanut butter. And cell A here is going to be sorry, the co-occurrence of X and Y together. Now I can do this with any two variables that I want, but specifically we're going to focus on this idea of two words at a time. So what can I do to show that these two words are more probable than I might expect given the frequencies of all the other words? So A, cell A here is the co-occurrence of them together, like cheddar cheese. Cell B is the occurrence of X without Y. So how many times, okay, cheddar cheese, how many times... Um, and there's a specific way you're supposed to put these in here, but essentially the idea is how many times is there cheddar but no cheese? C is the other way, the number of um, occurrences of Y without X, so how many cheeses are there with no cheddar? D is everything else. Uh, hang on to that idea because you're going to do this on the homework. So we're going to take that example and calculate a bunch of metrics. And we'll start by looking at um, asymmetric metrics. That's a weird phrase, asymmetric metrics. Unidirectional. And this are, these are statistics that change based on the way that you conditionalize. So if I switch rows and columns here in our frequency table, we'll get different answers. So this is the idea that a lot of Bayes people talk about. It's this conditional probability. So the probability of X given y is how we read a phrase like this, right? So the probability of x given y, so the probability of cheddar given cheese is not necessarily equal to the probability of cheese given cheddar. Okay. We know they're not equal. One's 20 and one's 100. Uh, let's see here. So uh, a good example is uh, raining. So the probability of me having my umbrella when it's raining is somewhat unrelated to the probability of it raining if I have my umbrella, because okay. I could, I always have my umbrellas in the car, okay. but the probability of it raining has nothing to do with the fact that it's in my car. Uh, all right, so bidirectional or symmetric metrics <laughs> are things that don't really change. They they conditionalize on the entire table, okay. so uh, they essentially include all of the cells. So it doesn't matter which way you calculate it. Uh, so things like correlation are, are uh, doesn't matter which one's X and which one's Y. Okay. It conditionalizes across all of the data. 
uh, conditional probabilities, and we're going to give them specific names here in a second, are unidirectional. Okay, so free association, this cheddar cheese example, is a unidirectional measure. Cosine, bidirectional. All right, so let's update these um, so I can show you how to do this particular table. And what we're going to do is do cellar door. Now, cellar door, because I, I called up a friend of mine, hey, give me your favorite phrase. <laughs> That's the first thing she came up with. So Edgar Allan Poe um, making this famous. And it is traditional to put um, the first word on Y and the what's called the colexeme, the co-occurring word on X. It's okay if you flip those, but remember conditional probabilities are, depends on the direction. So you have to think about what that means. So let's update these because these numbers are out of date. And so what we're going to do is first find cell A. So cell A is going to be uh, both of them together. Okay, the probability of seller and door together. So let's come back over here. I'm going to look this up in COCA. So you're going to do essentially this exact example, um, but uh, your own words. Okay, so what you do is you come over here uh, and type the words together. I need to tell I've done this several times. Okay. Find matching strings. Go. You don't have to log in. You don't have to create an account You just because you only use a couple of them. Oh, maybe I have updated it. So it's 228, okay, which is what I have. Now, B here, remember, is the number of occurrences of X without Y. Okay. So it's the number of times door occurs without the first word. So how often the colexeme, the second word, happens without the first? So we go back to search and just do door. Now, this gives me door, 210,000, but that includes seller in front of it. So what we have to do is subtract the times that they occur together. Okay. So it's, it's 210,000 times minus the times that they occur together. Now let's do the other one, so seller by itself. Okay, 4,026, okay, still minus A because that's including the 228 times that it occurs with door. And then this number here is just their current kind of global estimate of how many of the words there are in COCA. And that's such a large number that it doesn't matter if I have the exact number. Um, and that is listed, I think, on the home page. Let's see. Corpus contains more than 1 billion words. So, oh. 25 million words per year from each of eight genres. I swear at some point they had like the exact, it's like 560 billion or something like that. But anyway, so we'll just leave this number here. We could change it to a billion. It wouldn't really change um, the basic uh, probabilities that we're going to see. All right, now I'll update that for next year. The number is pretty small change, so let's go back and just look at what we find here. So the first example here, the probability of the combination given that I've seen the word door. So what's the likelihood that it's cellar door if I'm seeing the word door? Okay. And I would expect this to be a low likelihood, okay. a low percent, because I did multiply this times 100, okay. because door is so frequent. Okay. That's a frequent word. And so the likelihood of it being both is pretty small, and it's uh, less than 1%. Okay. However, I could look at it the other way. What's the probability of cellar door, the combination, given that I saw cellar already, and that is actually 5 or 6%. And that discrepancy implies that the cellar door combination is more likely than one might expect that order. Because anyway. if they were um, equal probabilities, that would imply that you get it either way, or if they were both zero. And then you don't see any relationship. All right. And so those um, have names, those directions. 
Okay, so the, the first one is called attraction. It's the conditional probability of the pair given the first word. Okay. And then reliance or faith is the conditional probability of the pair given the second word. Okay. So you can see words that are attractive but not reliant. Okay, that means that they, they tend to go together, but um, not always, like not in every scenario. And you have words that are reliant. Usually if they're reliant, usually if they're reliant, they're also attracted, but not always. Okay, so this, it's, it's not, um, this is a still unidirectional because these are just the conditional probabilities. Uh, now, do I need to call them attraction? I have them labeled in the homework as attraction and reliance. Um, but the idea here is that you just you're kind of looking like these words are clearly attracted, right? So the probability of of lexeme one, um, the first word, uh, but they are not reliant. So with door here, I see lots of other words. So they're attracted to each other, but they're not um, reliant on each other. And what we might see for peanut butter is that they're a little bit of both. And those are most, that's mostly the unidirectional measures. But then there are also measures that kind of account for D. So at the moment, the formula for attraction and reliance don't incorporate the overall frequency of the words at all. And we know that the overall frequency is important because we've already talked about categories. And so things like wings to bird are very salient and important, but birds have eyes, but people don't write them down. And so we have to probably also account for all of these other potential co-occurrences. And these are cell, these are um, uh, examples that we'll do here on a different one that uh, brain fart, <laughs> uh, requires cell D basically. And we're going to update these because these are definitely a little bit incorrect. So let's look at it here. Let's do he can and she can. Okay. So are is there a difference, a gender bias, in the use of the word can? Okay. So remember that A here, just leave some extra little notes in here, is the combination. And then B here is, uh, okay, so cell B, I just have to look, <laughs> is the number of occurrences of X without Y. So over here, and what we're going to do is put he and then can. Okay, so cell B here is can, cell C is he and she. So that's the second word. is the first word. And like I said, it's okay if you get these backwards. <laughs> um, and then D is everything. So let's figure out what the new numbers are here. So I'm going to do both words together. And it's 62,000. And I'm really gonna I'm gonna update these slides uh, to make this like a lot clearer. Here we go. So we're gonna also figure out the second one, but we're gonna subtract that sixty-two thousand. So this is what wasn't clear, I think, before. So what is now for B can by itself? Ooh, a lot. It's a very frequent verb. I'm going to plot that in here, but remember that the second word, second one here is going to be minus whatever she is, so we'll get back to that one in a second. So now this one's going to be he by itself. Also, pronoun, very popular. And then 
Cell D here, we'll keep using this 56,000, but it's minus A, minus B, C as a whole. But we've already subtracted the 56, the 62,000, but uh, B as a whole, and C as a whole. There we go. And so A minus B minus C. D. There we go. So I'm like, what am I doing now? Okay, let's do that whole thing again for she. So way less frequent, 25,000. So I don't know where these networks came from before. Okay, and let's find this last one, which is she by itself, because can by itself isn't changing. And it's also a pronoun, so it's way popular. I copy. What happened just then? So weird. There we go. She by itself minus he, she together, and then this one. A, A, B, C, D. Okay, perfect. Right? So this should not take long to rerun, so let's rerun that real quick. Let's see what the updated numbers look like. Oh, it's at that Fisher test. That's a little slow. Oh, the BM25 thing. Uh, wait, no, that's a different lecture. All right. That did take too long. Let's come down here. All right. So now let us calculate attraction, the probability of x, y given uh, y. So he can, she can, given can. Um, so this is like saying can. Wait. He can, she can. Second word is on X. My fault. So this is the probability of of um, the lexeme given he or she. So what I've done here is calculate. So it's A divided by A plus C. Right? So we're, we're conditionalizing down. All right. So the first word is on Y. The second word is on X. That's all, always confused me. So that's why I said it's okay if you do the backwards. Um, and so what we see is he can, and she is more popular than she can, but it's um, relatively like small pro probability or, or percent here. Because he and she are pronouns, and these are words we use a lot. So they're, they're not really attracted. Okay, these are very low numbers. But if I had to pick one, he is more attracted to can than she is. Alliance. Okay, so how much do these words rely on each other? Where this is still lexing can, he or she. X here is can. And what we see is it's twice as popular. More than twice. So he can, um, so if you see the word can, you're going to get he in front of it. Instead of she. So 2% of the time. Versus 1%. Now, to make things less confusing, <laughs> what we can do is calculate... Um, um, well, okay, this is not less confusing yet, but we can calculate based on the whole table. So we're kind of um, now going to control for the, the size of the data set. And given 500 billion words, well, what we see is that these are very, very small numbers. So this is called delta P, and it's the um, attraction minus the reliance, or reliance minus attraction. I mean, it's, it's essentially A over A plus C. Okay, across minus um, sort of down across the second row, okay, B over B plus D. So across the first row, then across, I'm oh, sorry, down, this is down. Uh, a over A plus C and B over B plus D, we're going down. Or we can go across, so A over A plus B and C over C plus D. And the, the goal here is not really to interpret the individual numbers so much, but the comparison of them to each other. So he is still bigger than she. And we see that same pattern where the reliance has a stronger um, difference than attraction. 
Now, let's move into the ones that, that are a little less confusing, personally. Okay. So, uh, we've talked about chi-square many moons ago, and Fisher's exact is a form of chi-square that tells us if there are associations. Right? So, uh, chi-square is actually kind of a measure of correlation, not perfectly, but a two-by-two two is technically a measure of categorical correlation. And so, we can use that fact to determine if things are related more than we would expect. So is cell A, the likelihood of cell A, given B, C, and D, bigger than zero? Right. So we can test if cell A is somehow different than we might expect, given all the other numbers. And what people do is they run Fisher's exact. Fisher's exact calculates the exact probability rather than using a estimated p-value probability based on the distribution. And it actually calculates the exact p-value given all the possible permutations of a two by two. And then we can log transform them. And the interpretation of that log transform is if they're positive, there's a mutual attraction. If they're negative, they're actually repelling so it's way less than one might expect, and if it's zero, there is nothing. And that's a nice interpretation, because it kind of matches correlation. And we're actually getting this no, they're opposites of each other effect that we haven't been able to see. Now this is good for low frequency variables. We do not have a low frequency data set, so it's kind of, um, I'm going to show you the code, but it's kind of hopeless here because the Cell size for D is so large that what we get is these infinite p-values. So, yeah. but essentially what we do is we calculate the likelihood or the expected value for A. So remember way back in that chi-square lecture, we said that the expected value of any cell is the row total times the column total divided by the total total. Okay, and that's all this is. Is this the, the what is the prop? What number do I expect in part A? Given how many parts are in row one, how many parts are in row two or column one, and total. Okay. Now this is the function for it's in Arling. It's the um, calculation of Fisher's exact based on these co-instructions is what they call them in the book, um, but collections. Okay. You just put in A, B, C, D. And this little if else here, so if A is less than expected, take the log of it, otherwise take the negative log. Okay, to calculate them and get this interpretation. This positive means more, negative means less. Unfortunately, these are infinities, so it's not super helpful. So let's try a different one. And say let's do log likelihood. Log likelihood is the ratio of probabilities of our of cell A to everything else. And so a positive log likelihood indicates traction, and the negative one indicates a repulsion. They're unlikely together. Uh, so what we see is uh, the function here, LL coal instruction, right? A, B, C, D. And we do the same if else function. Notice the little negative flip sides because log likelihoods are a little different. So we get these big positive numbers. My problem with log likelihoods is there's no scaling. Right? And this is actually true if you use log likelihoods for like model stuff. Right? You can't look at one by itself. You have to look at them together. And so now I can compare them to each other. So he can is way more popular than she can. So I hope you're seeing a pattern emerge that they're all telling me the same thing. Um, another example would be pointwise mutual information. Stock people really love P and I. <laughs> um, there's also positive point or PPMI as well, but PMI is the ratio of the combination given um, the expected value, basically. And so we take um, like, you know, the actual value of A divided by the expected value of A, take the log, square it. And so here's the interpretation, but the math works out. Uh, this is the easier form. So point-wise mutual information, the way I've always thought about this is if I know one of the words, do I know the other one? And so here, the numbers are small, so not really. So if I know he, I don't 
necessarily think it's can next. Like if I know it's peanut, my next thought is peanut butter, right? Um, but here, if it's he, it could be any word next. And if it's can, it could be any word before that because those are very, both very frequent words. Now, log odds, uh, little, little, log odds ratios are my favorite out of this bunch. And so it's the likelihood of the combination times the likelihood of none of it divided by the likelihood of each word by itself. Multiplied. Okay, so A times D divided by B times C. So it's like the cross products of your um, frequencies. Okay, you take the log. Log odds is a little easier to interpret. Okay. Odds ratios are, I think I have this on the next slide. No, I think I have, I'm thinking wrong. <laughs> so odds ratios are comparing everything to one. So two to one odds, right, or 10 to one odds. Log odds ratios put that in a scale that's to zero. So everything of greater than zero indicates odds for the D for um, the first combination. Okay. Everything less than zero is odds for the second combination. I have to remember negative. Yes, I think so. But it centers everything around zero. So here, a zero would be no relationship. Um, log odds of greater than zero would mean there is a relationship. Okay, if they're attracted to each other. But he can has a higher log odds than she can. Negative here would mean that they are sort of hard to 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 not be zero, right? If they're never together, then the number here is zero on the top. Okay. So I think it would be hard to get a negative. All right, so which one should I use? Well, they all give me the same answer, right? He can more popular than she can. And that indicates some little bit of a bias. Like why is, why is this two very popular nouns, right? Paired differently with a very popular verb. So what subtlety is there, right? Uh, so what's typical? What does your boss want, right? So always tells thesis students, right? do what your advisor wants because that's how you graduate. If you have a really small sample size, so you're looking at a specific data set and not all of English, uh, Fisher's test and log likelihood ratios are more sensitive. If you have a large sample size, PMI is really popular. And if you want to ignore sample size completely, uh, odds ratios and log odds ratios allow you to compare across data sets. So if you have multiple measures, so different presidential speeches, for example, um, what we might be able to do is compare, you know, the odds of it in this speech, the odds of it in that speech. And that's why I like the log odds ones, um, is the comparison across within data and across data. So let's do a little bit of this in Python, but do something applied with it. So let's take this idea um, and figure out how we can use it. Because this is all neat and this is like super nerdy, like these words are more popular than these other words. But what can I do with that? Well, what we can do is build a, a similarity match machine, essentially. So I can take text similarities and um, pick an object and find something that's very similar uh, um, to other ones. So this is not at all how they recommend movies or um, like if you're on Netflix, what's next? <laughs> this is not at all how it works. But a simple form would be to just look at things that people like and take that text and compare it to other things that have the same type of text because we made this argument for three weeks in a row that things that have similar words are similar meaning so if you like this movie with this plot you should like this other movie with a similar plot and we can use cosine as a measure of association so we're going to use cosine the correlation version <laughs> where it ranges from zero, no relationship, to one perfect relationship. And then we can also implement what's called BM25. Now, I will tell you that this algorithm, at least on my computer, is slow. Oh man, it's slow. So I, I did a mini data set version of this. Uh, but BM25 is how 
uh, most page search rank operator work. And it's kind of an extension of a bag of words. Uh, and their Wikipedia page is actually great if you're interested in what is BM25. But um, it's what we suspect is the shortcut algorithm to determining page similarity for like Google results. So let's look at Reticulate. We got Reticulate loaded here. I am importing pandas and reading in this compressed um, movie data set. And for this specific example, I'm just going to kind of set up the data set so that I have the title, the overview, its genres and popularity, although I'm not going to do anything with that right now. And then I'm going to throw together a description. The description's got the tagline. This is the thing that's on most of the movie posters. And the overview. And so like an abstract. And so the data set has um, the description is the main thing we're going to use here, but a title so we can compare date pieces to each other. And we're left with about 4,800 non-null objects, meaning no blanks. So the first one in this data set is Pirates of the Caribbean. And this is the tagline of the world. The end of the world adventure begins. And then it also has the description of the movie. Okay. As provided by the movie people. So first thing I'm going to do is clean up the text. We have not done just a ton of this. We've been kind of like slowly adding this in as we've started to work with raw text. But this function here is just uh, one example of the many different ways that we can do this. And um, one thing that came up a couple weeks ago with the um, Gutenberg text was making sure the data set's in Latin, right? That is not in here, but it's easy to add. So you'll we'll want to make sure that you um, also kind of control for weird characters or um, non-ASCII symbols. Sometimes it won't read them. Um, but if you're going to do this in like Chinese, you should obviously put it in UTF-8 is a encoding system that will handle um, non, you know, normal Latin letter systems okay. or Arabic, you know, etc. So <clears throat> what I've got here is um, the stop words. So just like with TM map and that kind of stuff, we're going to take out the stop words. And then I just defined a little function here. So this function will mostly remove non-Latin characters, but there are some other ways that we could keep those if you were interested in them and you wanted to do something other than English. But here what I've got is everything that's not A to Z or not 0 to 9. Take it out. Okay. Lowercase it. Okay. Strip all the extra white space, the enter keys, the extra crap that is in um, these sorts of things where stylistic codes, that kind of stuff. Tokenize and take out the stop words. Okay, so give me the word back if the word is not in our stop words. And then I just like threw them all back together. Now I don't, I didn't print this out, but essentially what happens is you lose a lot of V and A of's, you know, everything becomes lowercase, which is super important to make sure we're using, comparing the same words to each other. Um, and we've lost all these extra weird punctuations and spaces. Now this piece here is just um, useful for a lot of the functions of Python to convert our um, data frame, our pandas data frame, into a NumPy array, which we did. We've done a couple of times, um, a little less explicitly, but I was just going to be like, hey, here is our um, function we're going to use. And when you return that function, give it to me as a NumPy a vector, basically. So I can um, <clears throat> I can throw it into these other functions I want to use. All right, so then we're going to apply our function, normalize corpus. Okay. Our normalized corpus function gives returns a, uh, in a NumPy vector that applies this function to every description. And so I have 48,000 normalized descriptions. 4,800. One too many zeros there. 
Now we're going to create our basic bag of words model. We're not doing any type of reduction like we might have done for an LSA or um, um, topics model. We're not doing any simplification here. This is just simple a simple count matrix that has the TF IDF transform applied to it with the caveat that the scikit-learn TF IDF algorithm is not the most common version of TF IDF. This is something I learned from Twitter. It's, it's been about six months, but it's been a good, it's most recent to me. Um, they, they, the denominator is not quite, like if you look up TF IDF formula, there's one that a lot of people use. This is not it. I think the difference is pretty subtle that mostly it's math nerds and academics that are arguing over this, but I, if you, for example, compare this to Jensen, uh, you will get a different answer because Jensen does the normal one. Okay, so we'll warn you there, the mathematically, um, if you're comparing vectorizers, they're going to be a little different because this one's not the, the, the most common formula. So that being said, what you do is TF-IDF, whoopies, um, in gram range. So I'm going to use um, a single word set and double words. So we're actually going to use by grams as well as um, in grams, and this will just give us um, now that makes the, the matrix pretty sparse because right? co collocate frequency is less than um, single word frequency, but it does um, give us more to compare on to make sure that we're, we're capturing some of these little phrases. We're also going to say the minimum um, number of times something has to occur is twice, so I guess we're going to cut off the, the low frequency terms here. So you set up a little function, this hasn't done anything, and then you say, hey, take that corpus and transform it into a uh, words and phrases by documents matrix. The interior of that is the counts that have been uh, transformed using TF IDF. So we have our documents, 48,000 documents, 4,800, gosh, you guys, 4,800, and then we have about 20,000 words and phrases which is not that a lot if you think about it for movies, right? This is not that many after we've eliminated singletons, things that only occur once. Now, we can use the cosine similarity function. Now, I love here that they've made this more explicit in um, scikit-learn, that is cosine similarity, right? So it's a measure of association and not a measure of distance on our matrix. And that is essentially, it's not a correlation matrix, but it returns something that looks a whole lot like a correlation matrix. Uh, these cosines can't be negative. So if they have no words in common, then you get a zero. If they're the exact same document, so document one to document one here is a one. So just like a correlation matrix, you get a one diag the diagonal, it's called the identity matrix. Right? Um, and then everything off diagonal, and they're the same in both directions. So 0 to 2 is the same as 0 to 2 over here. So that's cool. So I have this matrix now, this giant matrix. And with that, I can pull the most related objects to each other. So this becomes now plot neighbors. Right? So I find the most related movies to every other movie based on the words they're using in their descriptions. For that, there's a little function from the book that just makes that a lot easier um, so what it does is it finds the the title of the movie which is a different column and it finds which one that is in the cosine matrix and so um, finds the top five so it takes the title finds that column in the cosine matrix picks the top five cosines this reverse sort, meaning highest to lowest, and then says, okay, here are the top five cosines. What rows are those? What rows are those in the titles? And returns it back. Okay. So it's essentially like you took a sort. This It's essentially a sort option. Um, but since these are in two different matrices, right, one of them is in a, the original pandas data frame, and this one's in this cosine data frame, we have to kind of tell it, like, the row over here matches the row over here. So let's see. So we got Shanghai calling. Oh my god. 
you guys are going to see how bad my spelling is. Uh, AI Colleen is a movie. Let me see. Um, that is a uh, romance comedy film. Okay. Let's see what it gave back. I love this example. Cape Fear. Hmm. Nobody on Cape Fear. Cape Fear would be a psychological thriller. Kind of a horror, kind of a horror movie. Okay. So um, okay, a White Countess. Let's see what that one is. Okay, that one's a romance movie. At least we're getting the right kind of romance, but it's a romance war movie. Mm -hmm. Summer of Sam and Capote. Both Capote is a, a crime movie. That's what Summer of Sam is. Oops, spelling. Okay. Also a crime movie about the son of Sam. Okay. So when we ran this on... Okay, I've lost my original slides. Here we go. Uh, we ran this on what should be a romance movie. We got one romance movie back. I didn't look up bananas. Um, Nana... A horror movie and two crime movies. Hmm. <laughs> so I don't, we can decide how well we think that works, right? Now it does work better for other movies. So if you do Pirates of the Caribbean, it gives you Pirates of the Caribbean back. <laughs> but uh, you can tell there are limitations to this. And we can do the same thing, but using the BM25 measure. I will tell you, BM25 is really, really slow to run. So I only ran it on the first hundred. But the um, function is get BM25 weights. You put it on your corpus. Okay. Be sure you leave it in this in jobs one for our Windows folks, because otherwise it will, ne it will never stop running. It'll be infinitely slow. Okay. And do the same basic cosine setup. It's not cosine, it's BM25, but the same setup. And for BM25, you get these kind of like strange numbers that are not normalized, but you can do the same function. So give me Spectre. Spectre is one of the more recent James Bond movies, right? Compare that to the first hundred because it's the only ones I looked at. And maybe these make a little bit more sense. So I'm getting other kind of action movies like Star Trek, X-Men. I don't know about Legend of Tarzan or The Good Dinosaur, but those kind of make some sense. Okay. So, uh, you know, these are only as good as what's going into them. Is my warning. But that's one way we can use similarity that we haven't talked about. So in a summary, okay, so you know, we started with culturomics and we ended up with culture again with using movies. And we can use all of these kind of simple math calculations to really understand the power of what people are saying okay, over time. Uh, so then we talked about the difference between a distance and association measure, making sure you understand which one's which. And then we've used um, some models we've seen before, like TF-IDF um, as an applied similarity calculator. And then what we'll go on to next week is getting into word to vec So word to vec is a neural, simple neural net model that takes everything we've been doing the second half of the semester and crams it all into one model. So we're going to pull out this idea of similarity and networks and uh, back of words models and put them into one larger model next week.